Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Holger Bersing. I'm the principal scientist at the uh, Institute for In Vitro Sciences uh, in the Respiratory Toxicology Program. And today I'll be talking about precision cut lung slices. So there are fairly um, a few different topics uh, to cover here. Uh, so first we'll briefly talk about the isolation and culture methods. Uh, the uh, precision cut lung slice uh, test system, what does it represent and how is it used? Uh, some established utility, uh, some data sets uh, that have demonstrated that their performance, uh, and also some current results uh, where we looked at uh, some different exposures uh, and, and the results that the precision cut lung slice has provided us. And at the very end, we'll have references and contact information if you'd like to know more about what you see. So we'll start with the isolation and culture. Uh, the way to create slices is fairly consistent uh, across the different laboratories where one first uh, inflates the lung uh, with a warm agro solution that is then allowed to gel. Um, and that allows you to actually handle the, the lung tissue. Uh, the tissue will be sectioned. Uh, as you can see, uh, the little squares were, were formed in the, in the top left between number one and number two. Uh, and from those uh, sections, cores are made. Uh, and those cylindrical cores are then placed uh, into a slicer. Uh, we use a Krumdike uh, tissue slicer, but there are several other varieties available. Uh, and then down below, uh, one can see the, uh, the, the slices here next to a Q-tip. Uh, that gives you a better sense of how large these are and how thin they are. We make ours about 200, uh, let's see, oh, actually 400 to 600 microns thick, but there are other laboratories that are making them between two and 300 microns thick uh, that are doing airway uh, contractility studies. Uh, and that's where things change here. Uh, once you have the slices, there are different ways to culture them. Uh, what I'm showing you here on this slide uh, is the roller culture method that we use here at IIBS, where we take that slice and, and we mount it onto a, a nitrocellulose paper that's contained within a, a titanium uh, insert uh, with a little bit of medium at the bottom of that vial. And those vials are then turned horizontal uh, and then rotated at very slow speed within a, uh, an incubator at standard incubator conditions. Well, what does a slice really represent? Uh, slices are eight millimeters in diameter. So we are not dealing with slices that can be made from the upper airways where you have the bronchi um, and uh, yeah, the first uh, few bifurcations. We're dealing with the respiratory parenchyma uh, and smaller airways uh, in the deep lung. Uh, and that's what you can see here. Now uh, we can see that this particular slice, that's an example, actually has airways coursing through it. Uh, but it also has a lot of the alveolar space, uh, that respiratory parenchyma. Uh, and, and the main benefit of slices is, is really that native architecture that allows you to, uh, to see that tissue the way it was um, uh, in vivo, uh, and that makes an assessment of histology uh, much easier uh, and, and easier to interpret, we believe. Well, where does slices fit in with different test systems. Uh, certainly when we want to establish whether or not a new material is, is a risk or not, uh, whether or not there is a hazard, uh, there are various uh, predictive tools that can be used. Um, that includes in silico and in chemical. Uh, but once you do move into a biological test system, uh, one uh, must choose one based on what you're trying to achieve. And, and certainly if you have a lot of different materials that you need to evaluate, uh, perhaps the two-dimensional systems uh, are best. Uh, but when you're dealing with lung slices, uh, we're looking at the ex vivo uh, three-dimensional uh, systems uh, that can provide a lot more. And so when you look at these boxes here, uh, which is somewhat akin to an AOP, uh, we, we have an initiating event, which may be a toxic insult uh, to the lung uh, after inhalation uh, or exposure. Uh, and then we have a tissue response, tissue effects, uh, pulmonary effects, and so on. And uh, as you move to the right, uh, you have more and more complex uh, activities happening that involve uh, many different cell types uh, and even over a longer period of time. So uh, things like uh, fibrosis, uh, tissue remodeling aren't uh, activities that happen necessarily in a short period of time and may take a long period of time. Uh, and having a model such as the precision cut lung slices that can be cultured for an extended period uh, can be quite helpful, especially since you have all the, uh, the cell types in that tissue at the time of coring. And you'll learn a little bit more about that uh, in the next few slides. So let's move on to uh, some work with the human precision cut lung slices that was done some time ago uh, when uh, our laboratory was supporting the National Cancer Institute. Uh, we were looking at a material called aminoflavone prodrug. 
uh, it is a prodrug, which means it needs to be activated uh, metabolically, and certainly precision cut lung slices uh, are metabolically competent. So on the left here, we can see control at day seven, and on the right, uh, we see 10 micromolar neoflavone also at day seven, uh, and you can see there are substantial uh, changes, uh, degeneration of that tissue following exposure. But before any of that happens, uh, if we're looking at a marker such as uh, interleukin, uh, IL-1 beta, uh, in the medium following exposure, we see an, a, a large increase uh, of that cytokine already at day one, uh, still persistent at day three, and all that precedes that overt histological damage that you see here. So certainly for acute uh, parenchymal damage, uh, it's a fantastic model. Uh, and you have that native architecture here, so you can really see what's happening to that tissue. Well, here's some work that we also did uh, supporting uh, the NCI, uh, which used various uh, preclinical species and uh, wanted to reduce uh, the, the use of those species. And so we, we worked with uh, rat precision cut lung slices, and, and we did some work to see how long we could actually culture them. On the top left, you can see control tissues at day eight, uh, looks almost uh, identical to day zero. Uh, and on the top right, we can see control at day 28, where uh, we do have a little bit of loss of cellularity, uh, but overall, a really good retention uh, of viability. Uh, we looked at that tissue biochemically, uh, looking at tissue content uh, of certain markers, uh, and as well uh, uh, histologically uh, with a, a, a board certified pathologist. And so we, we got a pretty good picture uh, of, of what happened here. So uh, ALP uh, being alkaline phosphatase and uh, LDH, uh, another, uh, both tissue content markers were monitored uh, during that period of time, and one can see that uh, they were ma maintained quite well. Uh, the LDH ap appears to be moving up, uh, but that's because uh, we do have some loss of protein, and these uh, leakage market data are actually normalized to the protein content in the slice uh, to account for differences uh, in, in, uh, in the uh, slice sizes, the, the small differences that may exist. But over here on the right, uh, we had a histologist actually evaluate uh, the, the tissues for uh, signs of degeneration. So we have percent viable here, but this really represents the interpretation of some of these cytomorphological changes that occur, uh, that are known to occur uh, when tissue degenerates. And so uh, we can see that uh, the alveolar uh, space and also the, the bronchioles are very well maintained over 28 days in culture. And keep in mind, this is work that was done about 13 years ago. So uh, we, we have actually, we like to think that we've improved upon this uh, to some extent uh, in the way that we culture uh, and, and the medium uh, components that we use. Uh, but perhaps the most exciting uh, is the pink bar in front, uh, which is representing the activated macrophages that are also maintained for a substantial period of time. Uh, and that is one way that the precision cut lung slices has an advantage over some of the other model systems there. I've heard reports about macrophages being introduced to the reconstructive tissues, uh, but they are inherent um, in this native architecture, in this native tissue uh, that, uh, that can be um, cultured for a long period of time. Now, if one can maintain uh, the macrophages, and here again, we can see uh, the macrophages uh, on the top. Uh, this is actually an ED1 immunostain, where the macrophages are these small brown spots. Uh, and so you can see there, there are a number of spots, uh, even in the control tissue, but over here on the right, we're looking at 10 micromolar BCNU, otherwise known at car as carmistine at the very same time point. Uh, and you can see there's quite a few more of these uh, brown spots or these uh, macrophages uh, uh, that are active. And so uh, this, this is something that we've found to be actually quite reproducible, where we have an exposure-induced increase in uh, active macrophages. Uh, and if you have these immune competent cells that are part of that inflammatory process uh, and, and can be maintained for a long period of time, uh, you have what may occur uh, down below. Uh, and the bottom left, we have uh, control of the tissue at day 28. And by the way, this is on the sans trichome stain. And on the bottom right, uh, we have 100 micromolar uh, BCNU again, also at day 28. And we can see that there are large areas of the parenchyma. Uh, that have these collagen fibers uh, that were formed uh, over time. So this is something that we're still evaluating. Uh, we want to see how consistent it is, uh, if there are uh, certain exposure concentrations uh, that promote this type of, uh, um, of, of phenotype. Uh, and uh, but it's, it's exciting to know that it's possible. And so we just need to evaluate this a little bit further. Well, here's some more current work that we do with human precision cut lung slices. Uh, we have a 
um, had a, a human donor where we uh, inflated the lung and actually were um, um, yeah, pretty pretty good at actually inflating them. So you can see that we have uh, a number of different alveolar spaces being represented here uh, at day zero uh, and then also at day 16. Uh, so I uh, had really good retention of, of viability and uh, we also exposed in this particular study to the materials that were probably the controls for toxicity. Uh, on the bottom right here, we have 13 micromolar pleomycin, uh, also at day 16. And you can really see uh, the loss of cellularity, uh, the, the tissue damage uh, that occurred uh, over those 16 days. And the bottom left here, we looked at the WST8 uh, viability. WST8 assay is very similar to the MTT assay, uh, but slightly different, uh, very soluble material. And what we can see here is, uh, well, the pleomycin, um, at day four, at day eight, and day 16, increasingly uh, producing more damage uh, of the, the human lung tissue. The other material here uh, is Fortress, uh, another chemotherapeutic drug. Uh, I have some experience uh, with my background, and that served as an acute toxicant. A particular study, because we really weren't sure how fast uh, that toxicity would manifest, uh, and so we ran these two controls. You can see that Fortress already by day four had a substantial effect on the tissue. Here's another material that we took a look at. Uh, so this is a quartz silica called Minisil-5. So if you look at the bottom left uh, picture here, uh, this is uh, again a human precision cut lung slice uh, that was exposed to this quartz silica. The silica can be seen as this shiny, this glass-like uh, material uh, that is in, uh, in association uh, with this alveolar space. And when we talked to our pathologist about you know, what may be happening, uh, he indicated that well, the material is there, but there really isn't any over toxic effect uh, to the tissue itself. Uh, and that is exactly what we found with our WSC8 assay. Again, you can see here the untreated control uh, having uh, an OD value of close to 1.5 uh, and the 500 microgram per mil and also the 5,000 microgram per mil, Minnesota 5, did not uh, impact that overall viability score uh, for that slice. However, uh, we decided to collect the, the media uh, at, uh, at the feedings. Uh, so these were daily feedings that occurred. Uh, we collected between days five and eight, nine through 12 and 12 through 16, and decided to look at a multiplex of different markers, including um, pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, proteases, et cetera. Uh, and that's what you see here on the right. So while we didn't actually cause an over uh, toxicity, we did increase uh, the, the cytokine and biomarker expression in the medium uh, following exposure to minisulfide. And perhaps that is the perfect storm uh, that one would need where you're not actually killing off the tissue, but you're uh, establishing a chronic inflammation that may lead to one of those more complex events uh, that I, I showed on an earlier slide, such as fibrosis uh, or collagen deposition. Well, there are exposure methods uh, for the slices. And what we see here on the top left uh, is the roller method uh, that, we, uh, that we use for that uh, particular study where I showed you the, the minisol and, and the other uh, data as well, where uh, you place that slice uh, in that insert and you slowly rotate it uh, and uh, you have that slice being exposed to the medium and then also the atmosphere. So in this particular case, you have the material actually solubilized in the medium. Uh, and certainly if you have that uh, medium-based material. You can also expose that slice uh, from the uh, basolateral compartment uh, if you happen to be culturing a slice in one of the culture inserts, uh, which uh, allows an air-liquid interface uh, to form. Uh, so you would really place the slice on top of that membrane. Uh, the medium uh, exposes that um, uh, medium carrying the toxin exposes uh, the slice from the bottom. Uh, or certainly if you have that uh, a physiological buffer that you dissolve that material in, you can just take that material and expose it to the uh, ap uh, apical surface where the slice is as well. So that's the simplest way that, that one may be able to expose. However, there's a, a new technology that uh, we uh, at IIVS have been uh, working with uh, Hewlett Packard on, uh, and that is the uh, using the digital dispenser as a way to expose. Uh, and in this particular case, we can see that you know, there is a uh, this D300 dispenser where we dialed down the volume uh, of the droplets down to three nanoliters. Uh, and uh, so we can go down to extremely small droplets uh, and create uh, these patterns that are dispensed onto, uh, onto a particular surface in a very defined manner. Now, these are three nanoliter droplets. So we did that because we had a, a food color tracer in the DMSO, so we could actually see the droplets, but we can get much smaller. I uh, understand the material uh, or the uh, instrument can 
uh, can go down to, I think, 13 picoliter of droplets uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to adenosote-based exposure. So we can uh, place the slices uh, in one of these early liquid uh, interface of these culture inserts uh, and place that in the instrument, uh, the D300 uh, in the multi-well plate uh, and create an exposure. And that's what you see here, that red uh, tracer uh, on, the, on the food color uh, that, uh, that's on the top of that membrane. And this particular membrane is about uh, 6.5 millimeters in diameter. So it gives you an idea of how accurate this needs to be um, to, uh, to create uh, an exposure. And the top right is perhaps the most inhalation or physiological-like uh, exposure uh, where we're dealing with uh, a whole aerosol or a whole smoke uh, that is being uh, delivered uh, you know, from a smoke engine or a smoke uh, and or aerosol uh, generator. Uh, and the uh, smoke uh, or aerosol uh, is delivered uh, through short tubes down through this uh, trumpet uh, that is just above uh, that air liquid interface membrane again. So just as we um, dispense with the digital dispenser or, or with the, uh, the pipetter on the apical uh, surface, we can actually deliver a smoke or an aerosol uh, or dust uh, or you know, other materials to that, uh, to that top surface where we would have a slice uh, and that material is then drawn off. So while this is the most inhalation light, uh, there's also some challenges in that uh, that uh, typically lies around how much material actually got to your slice and you know, what kind of a dosimetry are we dealing with. So moving on to uh, the, the next uh, slide here. This is really a summary of what we uh, can use slices for. Well, not just slices, but also three-dimensional uh, constructs. Uh, but I'm going to focus on slices here. Uh, and so, uh, Obviously, when we are dealing with a, a more complex model uh, that may be more expensive, uh, we want to try to get as much information from uh, that model as possible. So we're not in screening mode anymore. We're in more of a, a high content mode. We're going to look at a number of different uh, events that may occur in the tissue, uh, a number of different markers uh, that we'd like to assay. Uh, and that uh, can include uh, uh, various uh, different uh, endpoints, uh, inflammation, cytotoxicity, uh, tissue or structural changes that we saw with the uh, that native architecture of the slices. Uh, and so there is just a wealth of information that can be obtained uh, from the precision cut lung slices. Uh, and it appears that we've really just barely uh, tapped into it. Uh, there are a number of other applications that we're exploring uh, or, or using uh, the slices for. Uh, certainly we have some colleagues up at Harvard uh, University that are uh, using them for airway contractility studies. Uh, same with the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. Uh, can it be used for respiratory sensitization? We think so. Uh, uh, and certainly cryopreservation for increased accessibility uh, and, and reduction of cost uh, may also be something that, uh, uh, that we can pursue uh, to try to uh, use this more as a model that, um, that, that, that will appeal to different laboratories that are interested in inhalation or respiratory uh, test systems uh, to evaluate uh, a variety of different events. With that, uh, I thank you very much. And here we have some references. Uh, these are some posters and a publication that refer to uh, a lot of the data that you saw. Uh, some of the data that was shown uh, will be you know, in, in press uh, at some point in time soon. Uh, but certainly, if you have any questions, uh, I am happy to send posters. Uh, or uh, if you'd like, you can contact me for more information about slices. Thank you.